Okay, so in this video, we're finally going to get down to the SPFX Basics Essentials. This is one that I've been wanting to do an update on for the longest. As you can see here, what we're going to do, we're going to build a very simple web part, the Quick Links web part. It's not going to be styled on this particular video, but in this video, we're going to walk through setting up a foundation on how to get into SPFX easily. As you can see here, uh, just three, four different simple method, methods to make a SharePoint endpoint call, to gather list data, to gather document files within the document library, talk about components, how many components do you need, how much is too much, how much is too less, and then we can talk through all the fundamentals to SPFX web part. Welcome to the SPFX web part. Okay, so in this video, um, we're going to go ahead and get started about SPFX and some of the things that I picked up along the way to really kind of help it easier to kind of break the barrier to go ahead and get started. So what we're going to do, we're going to replicate this uh, Quick Links web part. And we're not going to build it the way the out of the box web part works, right? Because there's no, there's no benefit or real value. But one of the things that I've noticed just where working with modern SharePoint is that it would be nice if the Quick Links dip would uh, pull from a SharePoint list, like if it was powered from the SharePoint list. So what we want to do, we want to create an SPFX that has Quick Links that pull from a SharePoint list. And, and along the way, I would share some of my uh, tips and tricks on what I've used to kind of uh, jump into the SPFX in a reusable, repeatable fashion, right? So the first thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to just go to this code directory on the SP Classroom, just create a new folder, and just call it, uh, just call it Quick Links. And you will notice that I have one that I started, uh, Quick Links uh, list or a buy list or something like that, okay? So you notice I have this Quick Links prep that I started and you know that's just because for these videos, what I have to do is run through the process, identify the sticking points, resolve them, and hopefully remember them. So that way when I create this video for you, it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward and it flows uh, pretty effortlessly. That's the hope. So here, uh, I'm just copying that URL path. I'm, I'm not doing anything fancy here, and then just open this up in Visual Studio Code. And I like this path because, uh, one, it just keeps me out of the command line and doing like make directory and change directory and things like that. Here, I'm just going to the terminal, uh, new terminal, and it pops up the terminal. So this is my command window for this folder right here. This is assuming, big assumption, that you already have the SPFX set up on your environment. I'm not going to go through that. I just want to drive in like as if you're set up with the latest um, uh, SharePoint and Yeoman generator, uh, and NPM uh, generator, and all this other good stuff. So that's our starting point, and that's a big assumption. There's a ton of Google uh, cap uh, searches out there to where you can land. I would recommend using the Microsoft one. They do a really good job of keeping it up to date. So land on the Microsoft one versus uh, another uh, developer, a community developer's blog. So basically here, you just, uh, every, uh, to generate this project is just yo at Microsoft forward slash SharePoint, right? And that's really easy to remember, right? So it's almost like the email and then the slash like a, a website. That's one of the things that I use. Uh, so for the name of the solution, I'm going to go ahead and leave that as such. Uh, SharePoint online uh, only so we get the latest and greatest current folder. And uh, for this one here, uh, we do not need the admin to deploy this without activating a feature. And we're not using any special permissions and we are using the web part. So the web part name, uh, let's just do quick links. And, you know, and we don't necessarily have to get this right out of the gate, this, the name, because I can you will see in the manifest where we can change that. So, and, and this is, I think this is a multi-part video. So um, we may not be able to cover everything in this video, um, but best believe that we will be able to change this and update this in the future. So it just say quick links uh, by quick links by list. And I'm gonna just run this name all together in description. Um, 
power the quick links based on a SP list. All right, and then for uh, the framework, we're going to use React. That's the recommendation. So as this loading, um, just kind of cover level set a couple of things. There's a lot of different options on how you can do SPFX, right? You can do it with uh, jQuery and Angular and no JavaScript with jQuery or even like handlebars, you know, with just a templating service and raw uh, JavaScript. The, my recommendation, based on what I'm seeing where Microsoft is headed, you want to use the... Um, React front end framework, and you want to use the Fluid UI as your UI um, to, uh, framework for the front end. So I, I know, and, and you know, prior to this, right, we're all used to either Angular to Bootstrap combination or Angular and a materials type combination. But I would highly, highly recommend cutting your teeth if you're serious about uh, SPFX development. And not just in SharePoint, right? You can use SPFX for extensions to create uh, Teams apps, as well as uh, custom web parts, which is probably the majority of the, uh, the functionality. All right, so now here we are. Uh, as we kind of built that out, you would notice that it built our structure for us. And because we're in the folder as it's building it, we can kind of see things drop in real time. The other thing I would recommend doing right away is just do a GOAT build. This would just confirm that your generator did everything, but also there are several modules in there, especially when it comes to styling, the, uh, C, the SAS right, module that's used is not wired all the way up until you do like a gulp build. So you kind of get that red squiggly uh, if you don't do the build. Once that's done, let's go into our source uh, folder. That's where everything's going to live. And in here, you will notice that we have our standard structure. We're going to live and do a lot in web parts initially and then the manifest maybe right but this is where you know we really want to try to tackle and make some changes that we kind of get out uh, by default so the first thing that i do i copy uh, the main entry uh, module fo file i get a copy of that and then on what i do i rename that copy and append the suffix app uh, to that one of the things that i've learned and i kind of went through a pure react training right outside of spfx and in the pure react training i kind of see how developers or people are who are practitioners or people who actually use uh react in the real world how they kind of name and structure their projects and also some of the react uh, components or features that they use uh to develop their projects and i kind of took those best practices and took what we were trying what we're trying to do in SPFX and kind of fused them together. And this is the pattern that I came up with. So so with the app, app is going to be our starting point. So if you look at any project that we create, if it has list and app in the suffix, that's where you're going to start. That's where you get all your getter setter methods uh, for calling uh, services. Outside of that, so the one that gets generated, we're actually going to rip this all the way down. Actually, we're going to delete everything. And we're going to make this into a functional component. So here I'm going to just do a, actually just call it function. And then the name of it, uh, which is quick links by list, which is probably like the worst name ever. Um, and then this is just a function. So we just treat it as a function. Now this function has some special attributes. It's going to have the props. And as of right, as for right now, we're going to bring uh, those props are going to allow uh, any type, right? So that's just like the generic type. And then uh, because this is a component function in a separate file, you're going to have to export uh, the function in this manner like that. Okay. And I usually get this wrong. Is it export default? Maybe. Let's try that. I think, I think export is first and then the default function, whatever the default is going to be. Now here, because this is a component, you have to do this special thing here, which is uh, return the JSX. And so here we're just going to put in a standard div tag and then our hello world sub component. And that's it. And this is the pattern, right? So, uh, so all of your, everything other than your main component that wires up to your web part, uh, everything else is going to be a functional component within React. It just keeps it cleaner and uh, there's less hoops you got to jump through. And these are stateless 
in the sense that we're not passing state to them. Uh, they may use the uh, use state, uh, I forget what they call that, it's the use state, it's a directive. It's a special name for it, but that's how we're going to maintain state, but the state is going to stay within that component, and we're, we're going to follow the same rules that React is known for, where you use the props to pass information down only. It's only one way. Uh, you can pass a function as a property, and that's what triggers an event to the parent if you need to do like a click event or save function or whatever the case may be. All right, so uh, for now, this is our format, and you're going to see this uh, pretty often. Now that we kind of broke things, right, because we renamed the, the entry point to app, what we're going to have to do now is do all of our renaming, because right now i got two components in this, in this, in this um, project with the exact same name. So let's get rid of all this markup. We don't need any of this markup. We're going to rip it all the way down to the bare metal, right? And then uh, within that component, uh, within this render, we do want to call our component that we just created. So this guy here. And if we do that quickly, it will automatically import that for us. Uh, I do a Shift Alt F to kind of keep my formatting in, li in alignment. And I want to say that's it for this file. Now, because I'm, I'm bouncing between a lot of files, it's very, very important. And this always catches me uh, by surprise is uh, going to file and then save all because I got changes kind of sprinkled all over the place. Now, the next thing I want to do, I'm still in my massaging phase, right? That's phase one, massage the default project into our, our new standard. Uh, I go to the web part, and then everywhere where I'm importing that quick links by list uh, without the app suffix, I'm going to go ahead and force that in. And that's going to uh, highlight the, the web squigglies to where everywhere else I need to change that. This is a red squiggly that we're going to have to live with. It doesn't cause a build error or anything like that. I don't know why it causes and uh, uh, there's a syntax error for that. But it's just one of those things. That's the one red squiggly you can ignore. All right, so once we have that, uh, I think I'm all wired up, so let's just do a gulp build. And just make sure we get a clean bill of health. All right, so, okay, so it looks like we have a clean bill of health and we didn't get any errors, right? So now what we want to do is to start uh, wiring up the, the web part context and pass that into our class component. Again, our, the model is that the web part will handle all of the properties and of course by nature is gonna have the default context that's needed to make uh, graph API calls or SharePoint REST API calls where all those calls where credentialing and all the other stuff is done for you uh, other than being authorized to use the, you know, with graph, you know, so, but you know, as far as like the, your digest and all that stuff, that's gonna be, that's gonna be, you're gonna get that for free. Uh, which is the beauty, right? That's, you know, we can focus on the logic and don't have to spend too much time on the actual um, authentication uh, piece of it. Now, one of the things uh, outside of the renaming, I forgot one, one piece. The other piece we want to do is to get rid of this description. By default, we have this description web part property. And in our case, because we're going to, uh, we're replicating this quick links web part here, it's probably a good idea as a web part property for them to specify uh, the list name. So let's just do this. Let's just call this list name. And uh, let's just call default that with quick links. Right. And then just save this all. And now in the web part, this is the one thing I hate. And if you've seen my previous video, you know, this is one of the things that is one of my pet peeves. I hate naming things the exact same name and they represent different things. It probably is the same data that's flowing through them, but they represent different things. So with that, when I come to uh, this by list web part props, this is the interface that represent all of my web part properties versus the interface that represent my main component class, right? So because of that, what I'm gonna do, and I think this is a must, whatever name you give it, uh, this, this uh, cause we renamed this, sorry. So whatever name you give this, property in the manifest, make sure you replicate that name here. So we just want to uh, replicate it there. And then right here where we actually interact with that property, you want to replicate the name here. And then this string here, this is just uh, um, SPFX team being fancy, uh, where they have 
the ability, they did kind of show you a sample of if you were going to make this multilingual, how you do resource files and a framework for translation. In our case, we're going to ignore that, right? We're going to keep it simple and just assume that the language here is going to be English. Uh, so here, I'm going to just have the name of the list. And really, this is just the name of the property where we ask for the list name. All right, so once we have that, this is renamed to where we need it to be. Our interface representing all of our web part properties are going to be named that. And then here, you know, I have this wet squiggly because it's using the old name. Now, this is the property that represents our component class. In our component class, that's going to be this guy here. This is all wired up for you. So here, I'm going to call this, um, <sighs> let's name, do I have a different name I can use for this? Um, uh, list title, there you go. Look at that, creativity kicking in. So for the, my interface for my component, I'm gonna call this list title. And now if I go back to my web part, I should start to get some other squigglies. And that's the thing, like I noticed this, right? Like if you make changes here, as far as in IntelliSense or syntax, from a syntax perspective, it takes a little bit for it to recognize that change. And I don't know if it needs like a, a uh, gulp uh, build uh, for it to wire things up, but that's I noticed that disconnect from time to time. All right, so basically all of this is gonna be wired up. This Again, this is all we're doing uh, out of default. We haven't really modified any custom things yet. Let me just go here, make sure everything's saved. All right, so now we wanna wire up our context. To wire up the context, um, and, and, and this is what I've learned just by building SPFX and saw the maintenance cycle with this. Uh, I've learned to pass the entire context object from the web part to the component class. So that way, as you need things, you don't have to, it doesn't force you to create more interface properties in order to bring those missing parts. You, you can, it's kind of like a flow through. And that's the other principle, right? I try to do as much flow through between these different components, between the web part and our main class component as much as possible because your maintenance story becomes that much better, right? So in order to get this to flow through, here's my component class uh, interface. I usually just call this guy CTX, and then this is going to be the web part context. And it's surprisingly that that came up for me in IntelliSense. And just by selecting it from IntelliSense, it, it automatically wired up my import statement for me, which is nice. All right, so now let's go back to web part. And now I want to pass that in. Again, I'm not getting the red squiggly. I should have got a red squiggly that says, hey, you, you have another property on this interface. You're not setting it. It's required. And none of that is coming up for me. All right, let me sort of get a little bit uncomfortable. And just do a gulp build. Let's just do a sound sound check to make sure everything's good. Everything's still good. All right. So we'll see how far we get before. I don't need that semicolon. Let's get that out of there. All right. So uh, here I'm passing my context through. Um, so that's going to be a flow through for me. And now I, I think I'm actually done with the web part for now. So now most of my focus from here on out is going to be in my main component class. This is the most important uh, component inside of this particular web part solution. Uh, as you add additional web parts, maybe they ride in the same package, right? You can have multiple web parts in the package. But as far as this particular web part in this package, um, this is the most important component. All right, so here, what we want to do is to bring in our render. Here's another thing that, uh, and I, I don't know if this is like a best practice, but when I see the React people, um, developers kind of format their components and, and classes, uh, they always ensure that the render method is at the bottom. Everything else is right above it, but the, the common pattern is that the render for your component is always towards the end uh, of that component definition. All right, so here I want to do a private member, and there's just gonna call this client, and I'm gonna bring in the props here, and then there's my context, and then I want to bring in my SP HTTP client, and this is our main client. So for this solution, like I said, this is gonna be a multi part video. So for this one, 
we're going to uh, do a REST API call with the HTTP client, and then eventually we'll get to the Graph API client, which is this pattern is going to support both, right? So no matter if it's one that's calling Graph versus uh, SharePoint, there's going to be small tweaks, but for the most part, you like 90% parity. All right, so here's my uh, client here. And what I'd like to do, I will, I do want to specify the type for this one. So this is SP HTTP client, right? And it's not showing me any love because it's not imported. But if I mouse over, no, nope, it can't even find the import. Now, here's the other thing. Like, I love to be discoverable, right? I'm, I'm typing this out because I know that's what it is just by practice. But, you know, and, but in, in I, in, in you don't have to assume what, what it is. Just mouse over of the property that you're setting that variable to and look at the return type in here. And that's what's the type that you want to set it to. And that's important because these names here happen to be the same. But when you get to the graph, because we're going to use the uh, Azure AD uh, HTTP client um, class to, to make those calls, um, the return type is not the same name as the property, right? So it's always a good idea to mouse over, double check to make sure that you're uh, congruent in that way. So now what I love to do as far as the import, because I don't have all of this uh, syntax and naming down, I always start my imports with this type of uh, format. So empty curly brace and then empty string. And that allows me to help me with discoverable by leveraging the IntelliSense, right? So here I just do, I know everything I do is going to be at Microsoft something, right? And I know this is ASPHTTP something, but I don't remember the exact spelling of it. So I just select one of them, hold down the control key, hit the space bar, and then I'm able to filter on all my IntelliSense options. And that's going to be our guy. Now, once I have that, I can, again, go to the empty curly brace, hit the control, and then space. And then it's going to allow me, it's going to remind me of the available options I have within uh, that class library. And that's going to be our HTTP client here. Now, I also know that I need the response for this HTTP client, and that's going to be these two guys here. And really, to make this REST API call, these are on the only two classes that you need, the only two modules that you need. All right. All right. So once I have that, uh, the rest squiggly goes away from there because now it's imported. This one's kind of dimmed out a little bit because I'm, I'm calling it, but I don't have any cases to where I'm using it. So now let's go ahead and take care of that. Now, once I set my uh, client private, the next thing I do is build a reusable key, reuse, uh, reusable uh, function to, that's going to handle all of my SharePoint calls against this REST API. I don't care if I'm doing a, all my Git calls. Let's clarify that. To all my Git calls against the REST API, but it doesn't matter if I'm returning an array in the JSON or a single item in the JSON. If it's a Git call, this is the function that's going to call it. Right. And this is like a data function. Right. So if you remember your like your application stack, like back in the day, C sharp program, whatever uh, you have that business layer, data layer, this would be considered the data layer. So here I am. I'm going to just uh, and I, I do. I love the underscore. Right. And that's just me. Right. For private members. I love the underscore. And first thing I'm going to do is just set up my my function proper. And then what I'm going to do is specify the return type. So I know the return type is always going to be a promise. And again, I'm doing generic type. I'm not, I'm not going too crazy with the TypeScript right off the bat, right? So I'm, I'm leveraging my TypeScript from my interfaces. And you will see when we start doing CRUD operations where TypeScripting uh, becomes your saving grace. But as far as spitting out the results of a JSON, I'm very loose on the TypeScript. And, that, and that's a preference, right? There's no hard and fast rule. There's good rules, and there's a good way of doing it, and there's a better way of doing it. So, and I think that's contextual and it's subjective, right? So there's no hard and fast rule that you should TypeScript everything in the return type in the JSON. Too much TypeScript can, can be a pain in the butt, right? So uh, here we got a promise. Uh, I get a rest squiggly because it says you, you said you're going to return something and you didn't return anything. So just to kind of let that rest squiggly go away, I'm going to return null. Now, as far as the uh, get SP data, I know that I'm going to move this to a separate file, but we're going to grow into that. So for now, I'm going to expect that the user of this method is going to pass in the client 
and I'm expect and, and I'm forcing that tight, right? So there's no mismatch or a misunderstanding of what should come in. And then I'm a, uh, they're going to specify the URL again. Give me what I need to make this reusable because I only want to build this nasty thing once, and it's nasty, right? Over time, you get used to it, but when you first see it, it's just like, oh my goodness, that's a lot of plumbing just to make a REST API call. So here, uh, I, I'm not going to use the then statement to where everything's nested. What I'm going to do, I'm going to use async and await so that way it's clear and, and, and is readable, right? And I really like this. It took me a while to grow into this, but I really, really like it. So basically, uh, you, what you do is take that client uh, object that's coming in. You get your, your git request. You get method there. Your git method, uh, you can look at the IntelliSense. It's expecting the URL and then the configuration setting. So the URL is just going to be the URL that, uh, that they pass in. And then the configuration setting, I just know this, is going to be your SP HTTP class. Uh, grab the configuration off of one, off of that, and then there's the V1. And then I can go ahead and uh, close that out. Now, I should get a red squiggly because it says, hey, this is a promise, and actually it's not. So let's just go ahead and put my await in there. There's a red squiggly. So, hey, you're, you have an await in here. you got to tag your method uh, as an async method, right? So that way the caller knows that they have to do that you know you're returning a promise and they have to know how to handle that versus a sync call it's an asynchronous call and there's special provisions you have to make for that all right so once we get the repo so the the repo the repo is the response right that's just my shortcut for response uh, from here and this is going to be a um in in this repo is going to have the json right so here i just do repo.json and here, let me specify the type here for to help me out with the IntelliSense. Uh, the type here is going to be SP HTTP client response. All right. And now I get my JSON. Hold on. Something's not right. Something fell off. Why am I getting... What do you mean you can't find it? Oh, because because that shouldn't be repo. That should be RSP for response. So here's my response dot JSON, and then once you get your JSON, just return that back. And this this will be a promise. All right. So shift off F, and that's it. Those three lines of code is your reusable uh, method for making any uh, SharePoint data calls. Now, what, what REST API, get methods, right? So now, uh, what I want to do is build a business function. And my business function is going to be get quick links. And this is uh, not going to return anything, right? So this is like a subroutine, if you will. And it's not going to expect anything, right? There's no parameters to pass. That's if yeah, we can always refactor this to to grow it if needed. But this guy is going to encapsulate everything. It's just going to say, "Hey, get quick links." And once you call it, it knows which URL to bring back, uh, which URL service URL to use uh, to make that call. So let's just hard code this. Let's just go to um site contents this is my dev site collection now, and i recommend and, and with the dev site collection um are, as you can see here i have my own app catalog enabled you enable this using powershell uh so you just run a powershell against the site collection and then this will allow you as a developer because again there's only one tenant i'm always going in with the assumption that you're only working with one tenant there's probably a non-prod tenant for you know, testing the latest releases and things like that. But as far as our our day to day development, we're actually in the one tenant, and we need a safe way to do it, right? So I have my own site collection to do that, and then I have my own app catalog, so I can deploy and really, really, uh, you know, kick the tires on it. But yeah, that's something that you have to enable using um, PowerShell. So here, let's just create a new list. It's just a blank list. Let's just call it uh, Quick Links. And for convenience, we will have that show up in the, in the navigation for us. And then here, this is going to be the title of my link. I need to add some more columns. Let's just do a single line. 
for the URL. Let's add that in there and let's just do um, a brief description, single line for a description. I don't want it multi-line, right? Because I want these descriptions to be small. There's no need to be more than 256 characters. And then I probably want something like a uh, sort order. So this will allow, you know, allow them to specify which order they want to uh, want these links to appear in. I don't need a decimal point. I need, I'm only dealing with whole numbers here. All right, so there's my title, URL, description, and this is going to be my quick links here. So let me just copy this URL, and from this URL, we can uh, formulate or generate the REST API call, right? And I think Microsoft did a really good job with uh, their naming convention for the uh, API endpoints. All right, so here, um, this is a no-no, right? You want this thing to be reusable and things like that, but we're going to hard code it for now, right? And ideally, you want this dynamic to where, you know, it's... Um, is context aware it knows that this particular site okay so here I want to take this all the way up to my web name in this case it's going to be the root web within my site collection I'm gonna do an underscore API forward slash web and list I'm gonna keep that and then I'm gonna type in get list by title and this is like a method. And this looks so weird, like a method call within a, a string request, uh, URL request. All right. And then slash items. And this is standard, right? This, I'm not introducing anything new here. I'm going to just return this so that way we can see it. And if you want to, you just pause this video so that way you can get a, a really good look at it uh, of this. Um, URL endpoint. Now, this is going to be, like I said, it's, it's hard coded for now, but eventually we're going to lop it off to where it makes sense. But API web list, get list by title. And this is not case sensitive, I don't think. And you just pass in the list name as a string and then slash items, and that's going to return all the items for that. All right, so that's the URL that we need. And once we have that, we call our reusable function. So get SP data. And now look, it's asking for the client. And, our, and that's why we did this private member here on line 10. Because once I have that client local, now I can just uh, this dot get client, get for a private member, the URL that uh, they're requesting. And again, this returns a promise, so I have to do the then. Now, this is how I remember the syntax for the then. I always know it's dot then something, right? So immediately what I do is I wrap this in because it is a method, and then I close it out as, with a uh, semicolon. Then I come inside and put in the curly brace, um, and then kind of D, fat arrow, and then the curly brace, right? This is the only way I remember how to get the syntax right. I almost have to piece it together now, always, and my hiccups is always forgetting the semicolon or doing too much inside of the parentheses, but it's really just D, fat arrow, and then curly brace, right? And the way I look at those curly braces, because that's the thing, like, depending on the context of for how you use them, that can mean objects, but in this case, they actually mean the, the curly brace of a function definition, right? And that's what the fat arrow is. It's just an anonymous type function. And this is the parameter. So if you run into a scenario where you have to pass in uh, multiple values or multiple parameters to your function, uh, you're going to have to wrap this with parentheses. I ran into that scenario, too. When you get to um, dealing with forms, which is probably the most complex thing you can probably do in React, is uh, setting uh, default values for a form and reading for, uh, data from form elements and stuff like that. You get into some really, really tricky things. But the good news is the new React pattern, um, they actually have a much better story. The old one is, is, was nasty. It was real nasty. If you hear the word Redux, run. Okay. So, okay, so here we go. Uh, uh, here's our repeatable uh, function. We pass in the client. We, we're primed and ready to go to handle the result that get back. So first thing, I, and, I, and this is things that I've learned to do um, over time, right? So here, I'm going to just take that. I'm immediately take this and store it into a local variable. And then I usually just console this out, right? So just, you know, you want to take baby steps. Like, we haven't tested anything yet. We, we did a gulp. 
uh, build and just make sure we're not getting errors. But we haven't we haven't looked at this web part yet just to make sure that we didn't break anything. So you definitely want to take baby steps. So here what I'm doing, I'm going to stringify this object that gets back. And I don't know if this is an array or a single object, whatever, because this URL depends on what you get back, right? And let me just do a shift alt F. And this is going to just allow me to read this thing back. Now, um, and we're not doing anything with our component, right? We're still just trying to gather the data and make sure that we have the right plumbing in place to get data. The last thing we need is to uh, component mount, right? So uh, component did mount. And these are important. These are, uh, they're only available on class components, right? They're not available on function components. But again, if you designate one component in your entire web part to handle all of your service data type transactions, you only need one and you centralize these things that, you know, because once you set this up once, you, you never have to touch it. There's another one that we use often, um, component did update, if you're making changes to the web part property and you want to see those without them having to uh, refresh the page and stuff like that. Uh, that's the other scenario. But again, you just, you just, you just dealing with these guys once. But basically, this is like the entry point. Um, between the web part and then the component, and the component is almost like a document.ready. So this thing is ready to go and ready to interact with the DOM. And here we can just do call our business class, our business function, sorry. All right? Let's see what broke. So we just do a gulp build and let's test this out. And it usually takes cycles to get this down, right? Um, this, the, the more bite size that you do it, the better off you, the more success you have. So just do a gulp serve. Okay, but now before I do that, uh, I wanna make sure that the browser that I want Visual Studio Code to interact with is, is selected. Cause if I have many instances uh, highlighted, the last one that was in focus is the one that it seems to grab, right? So I'm gonna do a gulp serve here it's gonna run its thing. It's gonna flash me over to the last uh, browser session that was in focus. Uh, that's a good sign there, at least our web parts in there. Hello world sub, that's a good sign. Now, because I'm calling the REST API, this local host workbench, which I hardly ever use, right? Cause most of the time we're interacting with REST API and this is only good for you know, certain use cases. So we blew past the use of this really quickly. Just the fact that we see that in our in the in the web part gallery is good. But now what we need to do is go to a workbench and really kind of work this. Now I have my workbench uh, bookmark. So I'm gonna just open this in another tab, right? And I like to position my tabs uh, close together so that way it's easy. And once I do that, as long as I have gulp serve running, um, I should be able to see my web part, even though it's not yet deployed, uh, within the list. Now, uh, this is promising, so I still get that hello world, and meaning that I may not have any errors, but my console log is gonna be under my dev tools. So this is the third window I have to have open. And for the sake of this video, I'm um, gonna have to see if, how I can uh, massage these to a way so I can interact and bounce between them quickly. All right, so here's our, um, Dev tools here, and let me do a refresh. Make sure I'm getting the latest from my dev tool. And it looks like I may, and this thing always throw errors, right? It's, it, most of the time it throws an error because what you're doing, you're, you're trying to work with a prod environment, and um, but you're doing it in a, in a development way, right? Because like this local host service calls and all this other stuff are actually local from your, uh, your Gulp serve. All right, so this seems like one of the common errors. Uh, if I hit refresh here, it seems like something is not being called. So let's take a closer look at that. So if I trace my steps back, I'm getting this. So I know my, my render and all this stuff is wired up. And component did mount, get quick links. This should be calling that, and then it should call this. And then console. So let's just make sure our method right here is called. And and these are some of my troubleshooting techniques. I use console log a lot. Um, I'm in quick links, right? 
and then say that. Usually I get like a red squiggly here if something is like off, off, like terribly off. But I'm not even getting that. So it's, it's almost like a ghost in the machine, so to speak. All right, so here I'm filtering on, notice what I'm filtering on. I'm filtering on items because my REST API call is, is using quick link slash items. So that's, that's going to kind of trap that call. And then my, I can filter this on XHRR, meaning that these are all my asynchronous requests that are coming through. And now if I come to console, I still don't see, I still don't see my guy. I still don't see my guy and I don't know why. Uh, did I save everything? Yep. Okay. Uh, hmm. Is there something component did mount? Like I'm really, there's something fundamentally off. Something simple. Uh, let's see. That shouldn't, that shouldn't break it. Let's see, quick links. Another thing that I noticed that sometimes when I'm doing this save, uh, I have to make sure that this thing finished building because it's kind of like a build and refresh, like I'm manually refreshing, but I have to make sure that my build cycle is done. And sometimes it costs me a couple of refreshes to kind of get in there. I have this uncut promise. I wonder if this is a true error. Let's see, on error, event trust, no. I can't imagine that. Okay, let's do something simple. Let's just create, see, I, do I close this out maybe? Hmm. Uh, this is weird. Let's go higher on the line then. Component mount. See if I can at least get that part. Hit refresh and see what happens. Wow, I'm not getting anything. No, something's, is this the right component dip mount? It is right, right? And it's within my class. Oh, is this being called? This is being called, yeah, because I'm getting, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's just make sure I'm getting this component here. It's probably a, a rename error. So let's just call this uh, parent component. What I'm doing here, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that all of my components are being called, right? And just understand that from the web part, I did have to rename this. And I want to make sure it's not going to my child component first. And it's definitely hitting my parent component first. So to do that, I'm, I put it in the text in the parent component. You see that hello world sub component. The parent one did not come up. So that's a really clear indicator that something happened with my renaming exercise. So if I go here, um, Quick link app. This is app. And this is going to do is everything else is standard. Oh, see that? I'm calling quick link app, which is actually nothing because my module is incorrect. I'm surprised this worked, right? Like, I don't know why my gulp is not catching. There's a couple of like squiggly lines that I was expecting this thing to catch and, it, and it's not. So I just, I just hope everything's wired up correctly. All right. So now I wasn't calling my parent and that became a parent. Um, but it was calling my child because, you know, my child is the only one that has hello sub component. Now, if I look up here, let's just do this. Let's uh, click on this quick fix. Uh, delete on the unused definition. So that's going to make that nice and clean. And again, because you're, you're coming out the gate with a bunch of things that are part of your project template. So you just want to make sure that you're crisp on how you, uh, on what you're importing uh, because of all your changes and manipulations, you're, you make sure you're still only working with what's, what's good. So here, let me do uh, shift off F, 
get my formatting right. Now I should either get, I, I definitely should get the console out. I'm expecting two uh, blocks of text here. All right, that looks better. And I expect, um, good. This is good. Get list by title. Or I think it's get by title. It's not get list by title. I thought that seemed a little verbose. So here, through an error, it says that that was not right. So let me say that. And that's all you do now. Now it's all re refresh cycles. And check, refresh, check, and refresh, check, and refresh. All right, so now we got, um, we have our list. It has zero items in there, so we probably should put some test data in there. But at least we have our list. So we'll, now it looks like our call is coming through. Let's go ahead and put some test data in here. So let's just call this Yahoo. And then we're going to send it to this guy here. And then uh, test Yahoo description. And then sort order, let's just call it one, right? And then we just get one more in here. Just call this one Google. And then sort order two. And we really don't need attachment, so we can get rid of that. But you know, we don't we don't have to focus on that now. All right. So now that I have that test data there, I can go back here, hit refresh, and then you know I get something right, and it's more than what I had before. So that feels right, even though I'll, we probably have to go to another step to verify that that's actually yet. Okay. So now, the other thing I want to do is that. Um, I want to save that, right? Because now I'm ready to render this uh, JSON that's returned from this call into my component. Now, to get that, now here's another, like, I love being able to discover because you're going to be dealing with a bunch of different REST endpoints. The JSON format is going to be different for a, each and every scenario. So when I'm, when I'm exposing here some of my discovery techniques that I use to say, okay, I'm working with this API, what's actually being returned, so I know, you know, what property names to use and all this other good stuff, right? The most important thing, though, is where does this array start? And every endpoint do, does this in so many different fashions because they are using metadata in, in addition to everything else, that they're, in addition to the real data, right? So this one looks like it's going to start on, on this value, value, value object. Right. And that's important. So now when we come up here, we look at this D and say, OK, you're well, you're starting um, at the very top. But I actually need you to start at value. That's what my array. That's what I'm expecting my array to be. So I can make that change there and save it and do all this other good stuff. All right. So in order to use this guy in the component, I have to do that via a state, a state meaning that uh, properties. These are values that are available before. Uh, the, the component renders and be, before this render method executes. But because we're dealing with uh, dynamic data and we had to go and fetch this data, we need to store that into a state because the component render is not going to wait until everything's there to, to push. It's, it's an async call. So what you have to do, you have to use state that says, hey, this thing is coming. Once I get it, I'm going to hydrate this particular item. And then once you hydrate, you know, it's, it's going to, and it does all the hydration and detects that it's ready and render and all the other stuff for you. So that's something you don't have to worry about as long as you're playing within the rules of uh, React. And that's what states and properties. So if you look at this component class, and again, this is why things get a little bit confusing because you have to extend this off a of base class and then you have to understand which parameters to pass it. This empty object on the end, this is actually your state object. And because it's an empty object, I have to put something there to say, hey, I want to start using the state for this class. And now what I can do, I can do this um, state. And, you, you, and this this may be new because this is a, a, a new syntax or, or uh, pattern that's emerging, uh, on, especially on the React. So make sure that you have, if this breaks for you, uh, this, this line right here that, you know, where I'm not calling a constructor explicitly and then hydrating the base class and all this other stuff. And you'll see a lot of samples doing that. That's because I have the latest um, SPFX framework 
and I don't, and that in the latest does not require that, right? So here I uh, I can explicitly just have a state member, and I don't even have to do an access um, uh, access type on there like public, private, or, or protected. I think I just specify it, and then here I'm just calling uh, items, or let's just do something a little bit. Uh, see, I, I use items regardless if they're documents, links, files. Uh, news articles or whatever because it's just a collection right so I use items and I'm gonna just set it to an empty array because I'm expecting this guy to hold an array and I'm not type safe in this and that's that's not how you set up properly equal to an array um, I'm not type safe in this at all right I'm going with generic and it's going to cost me some some hoops to jump through but I think your maintenance story is that much more easier it's, it's better right I think your maintenance story is better. So now I have this state wired up. The only thing I have to do now is when in, in my get quick links, when I get my data back from my reusable function, I just really need to, I can get rid of this now. I can really, I just really need to, um, this dot set state, right? And I need to set, I need to pass in the object and I'm gonna tell it the member that sh that's in there, I need to set that to data. I'm telling you, it took me a very, very long time to understand uh, in what context did I need a semicolon versus a comma versus nothing, right? And um, that just come to practice and really understanding like the different objects that you're working with. And that's what makes JavaScript in general um, tedious, right? Because, you know, everything is everything depending on the context, right? And so like you're treating functions like properties and... Uh, you need a semicolon, you don't, I, I, I don't know, but I, I'm not going to get into that, but it's uh, just understand if you're struggling or fumbling with this, best believe that's normal and over time and over repetition, it, it would all come in together when you use semicolons, when not, when you use commas and all this other stuff. Understand when you're setting objects versus properties versus um, a variable and things like that. All right. All right. So that's just going to come with time. Uh, okay, so now that I have the set state here, I'm hydrating my internal memory. So imagine like this is just an object in memory. So I'm hydrating that in memory. And to pull that out, I just need to, um, let's just wrap this in a div tag. Just wrap this in a div. And then I'm going to just, uh, I'm spoon feeding you uh, this on purpose because I want to walk through everything. Uh, step by step. So here I'm just uh, JSON stringify because I'm dealing with an array. So because it's not a single value, I have to, you know, I have to stringify it, right? To, to kind of make sure it's everything in the array is displayable or my render method will spit out. So here I'm just doing uh, state dot items and just, uh, I should, I should get, I should get this console out. Uh, and actually, it's going to be on the UI because it's in my render method. And that's a beautiful thing. As ugly as it is, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing. So that means that my state is working as expected. And now this guy is ready to be passed to my item here. Now, understand what was happening. Now, now we're getting starting to get into the component uh, hierarchy tree and the component design decisions, right? If you have too many components, that's a bad thing. If you have uh, not enough components, that's a bad thing. It's a dial, right, of where you find the right balance. And it's subjective, right? Uh, initially, you probably won't componentize enough, or you may componentize too much. And through your maintenance cycle, you will that will be the lessons learned. And when you try to enhance this, and, and if you feel like things are spaghetti, or if it's too many tedious to make small incremental changes, that's a really a, a good yellow flag that says you probably want to look at refactoring this. What the guys say and the guys and girls on the React side say, it's okay to refactor your components. You're not going to make the right decisions out the gate, but React and this component tree is flexible enough that if you make a mistake, fine, refactor it and, and go with it. The worst thing you can do is make a mistake and force yourself to live with it. Go ahead and refactor, rip the bandaid off, refactor, get into a readable format so a way the developers behind you would be able to maintain your code uh, easily. 
So with this, um, I only have two components. I have a parent component that's going to hand, handle the collection, and then I have an item component that's going to handle each item within that collection. So here, what I want to do, I want to pass it each item. So let's get rid of this JSON. We did our test, and that proved to be successful. And now what I want to do is take a this.state dot items get back to my items use the map function right and basically uh, just put it that in paren I'm gonna pass it uh, my my uh, parameter is going to be the item and then for that item I'm gonna just pass it this component right so basically and then what I want to do I want to set uh, the link uh, property and again I'm making this up right so link is something that does not exist and I, I'm just making it up, right? So I'm passing in link, and then I'm setting it to the item. Now, it doesn't like something. What doesn't it like? What did I do? Okay, if I mouse over this, link any type is not a signable type. What do you mean it's not a signable type? If I go here, oh, I didn't specify my props. For any function component, you got to have a props parameter, and that's how it accepts all your attributes that are coming in. Right? So now, if I do that, uh, this goes away. I go ahead and save that. You, you notice this text is running. That's just me doing a control S on my keyboard, uh, doing my saves. All right, so now I have that uh, punching out. Uh, it's going to do now. I should get multiple hello worlds, but let's let's do something a little bit more interesting to make sure our data is making it down here. Let's do props dot link uh, dot title, right? So this is the record. So this this is the the whole JSON record for each item, right? This is the record, and then this is going to be the site column off of the item. So let's just say that, and I should get multiple titles. Yep, there's my Yahoo and there's my Google. All right, so now I'm comfortable. I'm getting a little cocky now, cause, right? Because things are starting to work. Uh, so now I can really start to dress this up. So now I, I want to do an H ref and the an anchor tag. I want to go ahead and, and uh, because I want to link this, right? That's the whole purpose of it. And then uh, here, nope, I want to do props dot link dot URL. That's my URL. And then underneath that, I want to do a description. Again, this is all for that one particular item. Okay. Uh, bup, 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 bup. This one says that you need um, you need a container tag, right? So this is weird, right? With a container tag, if I if I don't want to introduce any additional HTML, right? And you will see this in in, in a minute because what, basically what we're going to do actually is just do it now. But understand that there is an empty tag that you can wrap to kind of satisfy that error that we just saw. Because as soon as I introduce this diff here, it says, oh, you got multiple parents, right? You need a single parent to represent the output of this component. And then every, you can do whatever you want in, in the middle, but there's only one parent or there's one outer container. So most of the time you want to do a div, but sometimes you don't have an answer, right? Especially when you start dealing with uh, different components, right, to where you want to chunk things out, like a, just a snippet of HTML, you want to chunk it out. And maybe it doesn't warrant a another div container around there. You're just introducing more markup than what's needed. So this in this empty tag is it comes in handy in that scenario. But in our case, we actually want to pass an li, and then we'll go to the parent and make sure this is uh, is still wrapped in the ul. So okay, so for this one, what we want to do, we want to do uh, props dot uh, link, and then we want to put the description here. And you're probably wondering, like, okay, where are you getting all these names from? Oh, those are these site columns. And I know the names because we named them, right? So these are all the site columns, the internal name, not the display name. So it still frees me up to if I wanted to say, you know, link description or whatever on that SharePoint list, I'm just changing the display name and it doesn't break my, uh, my calls out, my call out here. All right. So now this is saved. Let's go to our component here. Let's just make this an UL versus a div. I think we're done playing with divs for today. 
and then we go ahead and save it. So now if I go here and hit refresh, there we go. It's not the beautiful thing. I mean, I don't have any CSS, right? What did we do with our CSS? Did we rip that out? Oh, I forgot this. So in my massage phase, I get rid of all of this. This was a real, this was, this was so misleading uh, when I first start, um, when I first start working with this, I, normally what I would do, I keep the container because usually, um, I don't know why, but I, I tend to keep the container. Everything else I just destroy. Get out of here. Get out of here. And, and, and I hate that. And I hate the CSS on that because what it makes it feel like is that you can nest a grid system. And with the fluent UI, that's far from the truth. And your spacing is all out of whack. So I delete it so I don't accidentally back into it and then end up fighting myself. And that's what you're doing. You end up fighting yourself because you're trying to massage your custom uh, art, a piece of art into some, you know, a, a predefined um, CSS uh, layout or pattern, right, for your web part. Delete all that. Get it down to the bare, uh, bare metal. And then, uh, so this white space normal is it's not going to hurt anything. Uh, it's at the container level. It's, we can override it, and um, we're uncomfortable with that. So let's give it. So to say all that to say, there's no CSS on this, right? Um, so this is going to look ugly. It's not style yet. And, and when we get to the Fluent UI, you will see how we can leverage most of those components um, and be able to rock and roll from there. Outside of that, I want to say that's it. I do want to... Um, highlight some of the reusability though right so let's get rid of all of the console piece that we've that we've created and oops and let's um let us imagine let's get rid of this one too that we wanted to bring in links not only from a custom list but also from a document library oh yeah and we want to get rid of this nastiness here right all right, so let's let's do first things first. Let's get re let's dynamically create our URI for our REST endpoint. So to do that, what you want to do, you want to go to private underscore, just call it web URL, right? And this is going to be a string, and we say that equal to this dot props dot context dot page context dot web dot absolute URL. Right. Again, because I brought the, the whole context in into my component class. Now, if I, oh, yeah, I need to do. Oh, yeah, I need. Oh, yeah, I need to. I have everything at my fingertips. I'm not going back and manipulating my interface just to kind of bring this new element in. Again, you know, it's lessons learned. I, I just learned that over time. And uh, it's, you know, it's just one of those things you kind of grow into. So now that we have this, your our web URL. We can do, if you spell this right, uh, web and then just plus that. And this is going to be the current web and everything else remains true, right? You probably want to go through the exercise to have them because we have a web part property for them to pass in the name of the list. So you probably want to go through that exercise to go ahead and get that wired up. But for now, we're, we're not going to do that. All right, so now that this is uh, wired in, let's just make sure that we're still getting data now that we made that change. Nope, we're not getting data. Why not? What's what's going on here? 404, what do we got? Look at Let's look at the request header. Oh. Oh, isn't that nasty? Oh, look, look at where my workbench is. See, I took a, uh, I'm in a different site collection now, now that I made that dynamic. No harm, no foul. That's easy, right? Your workbench can be anywhere, right? You just need the suffix here, underscore layouts of 15, whatever. So now if I go to this guy, let's do this. Let's open this up in a new tab. And let's copy this. And let's manipulate this to bring in the workbench for this particular site collection, right? So now if I do layouts slash workbench, you don't worry about the 15. It will resolve itself. All right, so layouts, workbench. Now here with my workbench, and then go ahead and grab my quick links. 
wet part, and I'm ready to rock and roll, right? So now this is going to render because I, I just told it, say, hey, get this URL dynamically based on the current web, not site collection, web. So if you're a subsite on your subsite on the subsite, it's going to be that current web. Uh, and then you can go and then create the list and all this other stuff behind the scenes, right? So now what we want to do, let's take a look at, let's look at site content so we see what's all in this uh, particular site. And we have documents, right? And this is um, a bunch of sample docs. So let's just take this, let's see how reusable this, this pattern is. So now I have uh, same web part, same quick links, whatever. And in addition to getting my quick links, I also want to get documents the documents from the document library on the same site so here i'm just do this uh, private git documents and spelling is half the battle i tell you so uh get documents and then i want to what do i have saved here oh so that's the url so let's uh i, I love that url And then you get that there. So basically what I want to do, I just copy the definition of this guy, pump it here. The only thing that I'm doing different is shared documents. Now this is this is going to break. I'm, I'm going to let it break and then we'll walk and see why this broke. And it could be, I don't know, maybe this will help you out if you see it. So this is going to break. Uh, get by title, share documents. It's still going to be dynamic. It's still going to bring back items. And that's the thing, right? This REST API call works for both lists and libraries. But understand when you're dealing with a library, you're dealing with a different animal because what they do, they separate the files and folder collection from the metadata associated to that collection, right? So uh, this actually will give you both. You just have to uh, understand there are some tricks or a few hoops you got to jump through, but you can get both the metadata and the files related to a document inside of a document library. All right, so what I want to do, I actually want I want to read this out. So let's just do a console.log here and just say documents and then JSON stringify. Read that out. Just make sure our format's good. Let's save this. Go to the console, hit refresh. Let's see what happens. <laughs> he didn't like something. Uh, where are you spitting up about now? Oh, I'm not on my, hold on, hold on, hold on. Is this my right dev? Yeah, let's just slide this over so it's front and center. Oh, this console doesn't match this tab. All right, hit refresh here. This is not going to work. I, I know why. Um, I just want to make sure this was a 200. The, uh, our docs is not going to work because we didn't call it, right? So if I got a uh, component um, mount, you have to call it, right? This guy should be calling all of your business functions so that way they can do what they need to do. And if they need to be in sequence, like say for example, I need to get my quick links first, then call my documents because maybe I have data for my documents that's based on my quick links. I can wrap it here, right? But if there's no dependency, call them in parallel, right? Make, uh, make them asynchronous in that sense. Uh, okay. There we go. All right, so now this guy's gonna call and I should get a readout in my console. Let me make sure I save it. If I hit refresh here, there's an error. There's a 400. And what's the error? There we go. This is not valid. What do you mean it's not valid? So if I go into context, my document library name is actually documents, but my URL is shared documents so it looks like it's looking at your library name right so once you come in here and then just make sure oh and i didn't put that end quote in there but it doesn't matter that's it's still going through an error so if i save this wait hold on what in the world I had little ticks all over the place all right so now uh if i go here hit refresh 
Boom. Blank. Interesting. Oh, I know why. I know why. Because we're set in the same state. So so our state got overridden because it, it load at first it loaded up with quick links, and then here come documents coming on with this thing, and it's loading it in with documents. And this is blank only because there's no title, right? Everything that we're referencing that's true for our list is not true for our documents. There's a different set of properties, right? So that's how, now let's resolve that. So the first thing we need to do is create a separate state for this guy. Let's just call it documents. And then we just set, again, set that to an empty. Again, these are multiple properties, so I'm separating that with a comma. Again, one of those things that you just learned. Um, and now for documents, just go down here, set this to documents, right? So this is the state property for documents. And this remained true for, uh, for links. So now I have that. The other thing I want to do is to create a separate component, right? Because my, the, the way that I render my property collection and my set of properties to, to, to display are different, right? They're different names. They're, they're tucked away differently. They're in different positions in the JSON and all this other good stuff. So basically, you just go to this component, copy it, paste it in. Rename it. Uh, it's, it's called Quick Links. Uh, let's, see, let's call it Document. Document Item, right? So Document Item. Actually, I probably want to rename this to. Let's break some stuff. Quick Link Item. This is that refactor I was telling you about, right? All right. So this now that I rename this to Quick Link Item, I want my component names and all the other stuff to follow. Quick link item. And let's copy and paste. Let's just let me copy this and then paste it everywhere. I need to update the reference. If I go to my item here, uh, this here, and then here. Oh yeah, and look, I, I got that for free. Interesting. Okay. All right. Let's see if this. Um, let's see if this works. I just want to make sure my rename and all that stuff is right. Okay, so I'm back to square one. And now I have a placeholder for my document item. So now, if I go into document item, let's just rename this and make sure we stay true to the game. So document item. And then rename this guy here, rename my export there, and I should be looking good. And then basically, um, we need to look at some JSON to really understand what we're dealing with. So if I go back to my console and let me look at my network here, I have two. Notice this one, look at that URL, get by title documents, and that's my quick link. So if I open up my documents and see what I have available, I'm a pretty much... I'm going to pretty much have a little bit of nothing, right? Because the thing I really want to get into is the file. And again, this only going to bring back the metadata related to the file. And I don't have a lot of custom columns on that document library, right? So I can spit out, just to make sure I'm getting something, right, and get things wired up. I can spit out, create it, and modify. So let's do that. Uh, those are going to be things that I can, that I can you know, at least confirm that that's working. Uh, so here, let's just say, uh, let's just use a whole in description. So let's call this create it. And then get a new div block for modify. And then, you know, you can put a label in front of there. Just modify colon. And then this one, create it colon, right? And then just save that off. All right, so now um, I, I need to go back and get some real stuff for this. But I want to I want to see this render, right? I want to make sure that everything is wired up, and then I'll go back and fix the property story later. So here, let me just uh, create another block here, and maybe put a, a, a div block in, on top of it. No, that's too heavy-handed. Let's just do an H3. I want to be crisp on when my documents start. Documents, right? 
All right, so now this document link here. And I probably don't have an import, so let's see if uh, this thing is going to allow me to do this import. And if I mouse over, no, no quick fix, no love, no love. So here, uh, just copy this because I already got one working, right? And then just call this document. And I'm actually uncomfortable with this not being wrapped in curly braces because I normally wrap this in curly braces. And it's, and it's not breaking or anything. Uh-oh. Does it not like curly? Oh, he's saying that that's not a valid member there. Yep, so you have to specify the right file name. So document item. There we go. And it has no exported member. Export. Oh. Document item. Oh, you're not spelling it right, Deshaun. It's just document item, not document link item. Right? Is this still off? Okay, let me make sure everything's saved. Copy and paste can get you in a lot of trouble. Copy and paste can get you in a lot of trouble. Uh, maybe I should have said default export. So it it won't, I'm I'm not used to that. Oh, I bet you this syntax is wrong. I'm gonna have to follow up with you on that syntax. That syntax may not be right. Uh, no, even with a, a single component, um, I was able to still wrap that inside of a export default. Here's an example. What did I call it? Yeah, export default. Hmm, interesting. I'll follow up on that one. But I'm not used to those being wrapped in the curly brackets. All right, so now uh, we're here. Hold on, let me save. Every, let me make sure everything's saved. All right, so here we have document item. Here, uh, we're doing the same spit out here. Instead of items, we're actually doing documents. And we're mapping that. Uh, you're calling it item, that's fine. This is a local variable only within that um, scope within that map function, right? That does, that's not gonna bleed into that. So these two are mutually exclusive even though they have the same name. Okay, fine, whatever. So, um, oh, I heard you. So, yeah, cause I said I didn't want to name things the same even though they mean different they represent different data or different objects right so here we got we got doc doc and save this go here and refresh it and now i should at least get the dates for the documents right perfect no that's good all right so now let's go through the pain and it's a pain uh to get the file and i just know this right and you you can google search and find it out it's buried but it's there but basically, uh, what you have to do in your REST call, when you're dealing with a library, you have to specify um, one because you, you have to expand a, a property called uh, file, right? And when you do that, you have to, let, let, me, let me put this in a separate line because this is gonna get wide and, and bleed over and cause a scroll. Right, and then that's the question mark. Let's do a dollar sign. This is my old data select. So uh, I know that file name, right? And then file, I, don't, I can't remember the URL. So, so we'll discover that together. And then I'm using create it. So let's do create it and I'm using modify. So let's do modify. And now you have to do the special one, uh, expand. And then just tell it to expand the file object because basically what this is, and, and I don't know why it doesn't come in as a property. Uh, I'm sorry, it's the uh, the metadata on the document library, but um, it doesn't. And it's just one of those things that you have to Google search and find. But this is how you find it. So I'm expand out file, and then we have to go and dig some more to actually get the other available properties under this file object, and then select them explicitly. 
because anytime you do the expand from what I understand, like I, I don't know how you can select everything and then just do an expand because if I do an expand on file, it's going to say you're not, you don't have file selected, right? So you kind of have to dig deep. There's many scenarios where you need this expand. So just be aware that something like this exists and it probably takes some Google search to figure out what's available for your particular scenario, right? Like if you're dealing with a person field, a people person group field, uh, you have to expand in order to get other properties under that person object since that's like a, you know, a super object, so to speak. All right, so here we go. Uh, here's our select on that. Uh, it has our file, that's our file object. Our modified creator is there. And then here it has file O data, uh, this URL here. This is what you need to grab to get more information on file. So once I do that, uh, you will notice that my name came through. So that name is available, but the URL, uh, again, I, I, I can't remember the URL um, property name. So here, let me go and that's my web. That's the suffix for my REST API call. And if I grab the prefix, it's gonna be all of this here. And then I can just dump this in the browser. It's gonna be ugly because I don't have like an XML reader but um we we'll figure it out we we'll figure it out together all right so here's my xml i think the last trick i used i just went into this guy here did a uh, file new oh uh is this my new file oh that was scary i felt like my i felt like my my mouse slipped all right so file new and then i do shift alt f and that's going to format the uh, XML for me, right? I, I, and I understand we're using JSON, but uh, this is just a, a different format of the same data. Now here I can get that server relative URL. That's a property, but I want the link, right? I want to be able to link to the actual document. And this looks promising, this guy right here, right? You get that nasty GUID on the end. I don't know what that means, right? but um, that looks promising uh, more so than this. I guess I could use this server relative URL and then just append my, my web-based URL to it, right? Um, you can do that, but let's just grab this because this seems like this is gonna give us everything we need. So let's do, so there's linking URI and there's linking URL. And if I look at the difference, oh, it looks like one is encoded and one is not. So let's take the encoded one. So it's linking your your eye. So to use this, what you do, you go back to your uh, REST API call, and then basically just drop that in there. So you say file forward slash, and then the link to it, and then a comma uh, to separate the other calls, and that's it. And then this guy should come. Uh, come along with the right now. So let's go back to our guy, hit refresh. Let's go to our console, see what, see what was spit out. There's our name and that's it. All we got was the name. I think this was a, a situation where our refresh was faster than the build. So now let's try it again. Nope, it wasn't. Something's off. Uh, what? Mm. Did I not save it? Nope. You got to save it. See? If you make changes and don't save it, they, they don't work. It doesn't work. It's web technology. All right. So let's go here. All right, so there's our link URL, and then we're ready to rock and roll. Okay, so now we're, we're, we're wired. I mean, we have this file here. The file name is easy. This is, I, I probably fat fingered this one, so I'm going to copy it. And now we go into our document item, and the file URL is going to be this guy here. So understand our link represents the record. Their property name is file, and then... Uh, 
which is an object, and then the inner property within that is going to be the linking URL. So that's going to take care of that. And then this guy is file.name, right? And that's going to be the name of my document. And then if I save it, and then come in here and hit refresh, there we go. And now I can click on this, and it opens the document. It opens the document in the same tab, which I don't like. And that's an easy fix, right? So if we want these to open up a new tab, just put in our trusty target attribute. And then make that blank. All right. That's it. Hit refresh. Make sure that nothing's broken. And... We're golden. Golden. All right. And and so I like this, right? So um, like I said, it's a reusable pattern, reusable pattern. Uh, I showed you how to bring in both uh, an example from a list and a library. Now you can grow this thing however you want. Uh, you can get more precision by possibly putting a select statement here on your quick links to where you're only bringing back the columns that you care about. It's probably a good idea, especially if you're expecting like tens of thousands of items in there. It would just make your 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 read back uh, that much uh, more lean, uh, if you would. Not saying that you're going to bring back ten thousand, but the more that you have to filter on, um, that I, I think there's some performance improvement. I think it's just best practice uh, either way, right? So if I move all of this out. Um, I'm not going to get into, you know, maybe I, maybe I can. This video is becoming long, but I think it's a lot of valuable information. And I didn't want to skimp it, and I didn't want to speed through it. So the only other thing that I think that we probably want to do is for this guy here. This is a reusable guy. And most of the time in any uh, development uh, environment, you, you kind of put your reuse uh, methods or functions and more like a, in a in a class, uh, maybe like a singleton type class, to where you use it like a utility, and you everything that you need is always there. Uh, it's almost like your 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 go to, so to speak. So in this scenario, what I want to do, I want to break out a separate file. Uh, let's just call it utilities, and I think I want to create it here at the uh, web part directory, and and I usually just call this utils, and it is a module, right? So you have to have a ts in there. And uh, let me just confirm where this lives uh, on the web parts. Yeah, so I have to have it higher enough in the hierarchy so that way when, when I'm doing, I'm priming this in the event if I want to have multiple web parts within the same package, all my web parts can use this one utilities file. Uh, so all my common uh, methods I can just keep in there. We definitely don't want to duplicate code, right? So this is going to keep the duplication down to a minimum. Um, so here, what I want to do is now that I have this utils in there, I can come in here and copy, uh, if I go to the right uh, area, copy this guy. So let's just uh, let's make this an X. That's going to break a lot. Go into my utils, paste that in. Now, this is not a class, right? This is just a, a module uh, file. So I need to put function in there and I think it's async. I think the method is like async function. I think that's the right syntax, right? There's no export, right? Because what you're building is just a library of functions and reusable stuff that you can call on. Um, it's crying that it doesn't understand what um, SP client is, right? And it just means that it needs to import. So here we just do, let's just go and make things easy for us. Just copy this import here. And that import probably can go away. Uh, we'll see. I don't think it's used anywhere else. All right. So now that's happy. And no underscore because this is not a private m function anymore. And I I think that's right. It looks good. So now what we would do, we we'll go to our app again like as this grow the fact that this has an, a special suffix on it you know exactly where to go to grab that guy is very very useful and really just help you you know with your dev cycle all right so now this is complaining it says hey you're, you're calling something that no longer exists 
Okay, so now we want to bring in that utils class. Now this is where things get a little interesting. The good news is we have a sample. I want to bring in this utility um, class, right? And have available all my functions in that utility class in the IntelliSense manner. So to do that, I, I have to say bring in everything. That's the wild card. So bring in everything. And here you can get to call it any local variable that you want to represent it. And then you're going to say from somewhere. And this is where I go hunting. All right. So you, I'm leveraging IntelliSense to kind of see where I'm at in the tree. And then uh, I do that a couple of times. And then my utils pop up and I'm ready to rock and roll. So now I can use it. So now instead of this, this is going to be utils dot get SP data. No. I did mean util. Mm, do I want to S on this? I do want to S on that. So it's my utilities uh, dot SP data. Okay. What's wrong? Are you saved? Yep, you're saved. Hmm. What's wrong? Do you have to export these? Hmm. I think you do. Yeah, I think you have to export all of these individually, right? There we go. Yeah, I guess that makes sense, right? So you're telling them that this is available to be used outside of the file versus a, because, uh, you know, even the utilities can call on another reusable uh, set of functions that can live in this file as well, and those will not be exported because they're only supposed to be used by these guys in that scenario. But that's how you do it. I mean, you just, uh, so now my utils is, is wired up. And uh, any common, and, and these don't have to be service calls either, right? They can be like date, like when you're dealing with, date, dealing with dates in JavaScript is like painfully, unridiculously difficult for no apparent reason, especially with formatting, right? So once you find that um, magic JavaScript snippet, you save it in your YouTube file, and then that anytime you need to format a date or whatever the case you need to do, uh, you will have that available to you and you're ready to rock and roll. All right, so let's just make sure, oh, this is our file that we use to format our XML. We don't want to save that anywhere inside of our project. So don't say kill it. And now if I go here, hit refresh, magically everything works still. And that's and this truly is magic. All right, so we covered a lot. We covered a lot today. Um, Again, a lot of this is opinionated, but I think um, when you're dealing with SPFX, one, you have to make a decision which path you want to go out. The recommendation is to do React and Fluent UI. Most of the examples that you're going to find with Microsoft, with the PMP community, and other uh, people, uh, developers in the community, may have a lot of React sample code. So it helps you with not having to translate that. I'm not going to say it's easy, right? I'm not going to be the one that is so easy and all this other good stuff. It took hours, weekends, and nights for me to really get comfortable with using it. Uh, another great resource is looking at the PMP samples, right? So you know you have like the PMP uh, SharePoint Starter Kit, the V2. They did a really, really good job on how you do this, how you do that, and show you sample code, right? Understand that every developer style is going to be different, and that's really meant to be a starter kit, right? It's not meant to grab and rename it and push it to prod, right? So it's really meant to be like a starter kit as a developer. You use it as a launching pad, then you style it and you do whatever you need to do around that. But it's super duper important to understand which path to go down because if you just do a generic Google search on SPFX and modern SharePoint, you're going to get a lot of articles all over the place. You're going to have people with Angular samples, mustache, pure JavaScript. There's going to be a lot of opinions. Some of them may be TypeScript heavy, like TypeScript overboard, right? Uh, some of them are going to be um, 
hacky a little bit. And most of the time they're hacky, not because there's bad developers, but just because they're really focused on one little piece of it. So everything else is just kind of thrown together just to kind of get you to that piece. Because as you can see, it's all layers, right? So you have to do something here, something here, something here, just to focus on this piece right here, right? So it's layers and a lot of people are just going, especially from a from a, a sample perspective, it's just going to throw things together just to get to that, that inner onion uh, as fast as possible, right? But here you can see, um, you can grow into this. Uh, this is has a lot of reusable pieces. Um, it's not styled, so that's one thing that we have to tackle. And two, it only handles Git requests. So what about the CRUD operations? And that's the other thing we have to tackle. So welcome to the SPFX series. I think it's gonna be, and these are videos are gonna be long, so expect them to be an hour, 90 minutes. I'm not going to try to fit them into a 15, 20 minute video. So it's one of those things where you uh, take it in chunks, pause it, come back to it, pause it, come back to it. But uh, with that said, welcome to the SPFX series. See you in the comment section. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.